Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Cranky Gun Reviews. And uh, I have gotten such an overwhelming response from my first clip show from Paul Harrell. I have gotten countless requests for different clips from different videos. So I decided to make a second Paul Harrell uh, best of clip show. And this one might be a little bit long in the tooth. Uh, it's the Dawn of Time video. I have spent about eight or nine hours going through tons of videos. I mean, when you have about 405 videos that span 11 or 12 years, it's really hard to go through all of those and figure out every single clip that you want to put in here. But I found some really good ones, some really iconic ones, some really fun ones. And I have a lot fewer of the Pop-Tarts ads in this particular one, but who cares? I love the Pop-Tarts ads. So Paul Harrell, thank you again for everything you've done for the gun community and for keeping people well-informed and keeping people's egos in check, as well as giving us lots of caveats, yabbits, yeah, Joe stories, and... Is that a sniper? But to get back on task, everything I'm going to say today are my conclusions and my opinions. My opinions are based on my training, my education, and my experience. Different people have different experiences, so they have different opinions. I make no claim that my opinion has its origin in the mind of greatness. And if someone does make that claim, it should severely strain your credulity. The camera crew just pointed out to me that sometimes I forget I gotta spread these shots out. It doesn't tell us much if they both go through the same hole. And we were discussing an upcoming trip where we were going to travel to a jurisdiction where fireworks were legal and have a fireworks battle. Side note, shooting bottle rockets and Roman candles at each other might sound like a lot of fun. Do not ever do it. It's a miracle we didn't really seriously injure somebody. A lot of 1911s come with idiosyncrasies. This one's no exception. I can't shoot this gun unless I also put on all the bling that goes with it. And not only that, I also have to change shooting jackets before I shoot this gun. And for all the fanciness, it's still an off-the-shelf, out-of-the-box cold. And it functions flawlessly. Now, I'm not just your average spaz. I've actually won a lot of competitions for tomahawk and knife throwing. I've got this M16A1 loaded with Remington green and white box 223 Remington 55 grain full metal jacket spear point and this Colt government model loaded with Remington green and white box 45 ACP 230 grain full metal jacket round nose. And from a distance of 7 yards I'll shoot this meat target which is followed by the new and improved high tech fleece bullet stop. This is my 1965 Ford Thunderbird. It's got automatic transmission and power steering, and you can see when you roll down the front and rear windows, you just get one big window, even though the rear window is not very big. What? Yes, of course I'm shamelessly showing off my car. Now, if I were going to offer Johnny any constructive criticism, it would be that because I'm a cosmopolitan sophisticate, I make very highbrow choices in terms of firearms-related fashion, and he might want to reevaluate his wardrobe. Also, the ongoing thing about which one might fit my hand better has caused some bickering among a couple of my colleagues, even though, of course, I do not have any favorites. A while ago, there was somebody who considered himself a real expert on home defense shooting, and he said that, in home defense shooting, the most likely scenario would be, quote, between two and five people storming your home with quick and overwhelming force. That's fact one. Close quote. Okay, that is an opinion that I greatly dissent from. Although those kind of things can happen, I find that two to five people scenario far less likely than scenarios such as someone who is just delusional, whether that dementia is organic or chemically induced, and he thinks your house is his FBI safe house and that you're some kind of criminal, and he ends up doing something violent. Ladies especially, some kind of creepy, pervo, serial murder, rapist kind of person. 
There's also the burglar that kicks your door in because he thinks you're not home when you are. And again, ladies, that creepy ex-boyfriend you have that's declared if he can't have you, no one will. I find those scenarios and many others to be far more likely than two and five people storming your home with quick and overwhelming force. However, that's under normal conditions. Things right now are not normal. Now, sight alignment and sight picture are related, but they're not the same thing. And right now is when someone who knows more about computers but less about guns than I do would show you a really cool computer graphic. No, I just drew a picture of it. The FBI has been telling us for decades that the mean average distance for a lethal confrontation is seven yards. The FBI has been telling us for decades that the mean average distance for a lethal confrontation is seven yards. Now the FBI has been telling us for decades that the mean average distance for a lethal confrontation is seven yards. So many people look at me and become immediately and irrevocably convinced that I'm developmentally disabled or just plain stupid. This in part explains my tendency towards sesquipedalianism and also explains why I don't like to wear safety glasses when I'm on camera. When this is what I've already got to work with, I don't need to exacerbate the problem. Let's see if it'll shoot. Of course it'll shoot out of an A1. I can tell you in all honesty and sincerity, I have eaten Pop-Tarts that were over six years old. A question that's been asked a lot lately is about my shooting jackets in general and especially about my newest one. So for this occasion I dug out my original shooting jacket. You can see why I don't wear it any longer. It's pretty much a rag. When this jacket started out it was actually closer to this color. Now this has pockets and then lower pockets with shot shell loops and then a game bag where you can put dead rabbits, squirrels, birds, whatever. This jacket is similar. It's got a padded shooting shoulder, it's got the pocket, it's got the lower pocket with shot shell loops, but the game bag, instead of being an integral part of the jacket, is attached to the outside and it's a zippered pouch. You can take it off and launder it separately. Now most of the jackets that I've worn have a Sears or J.C. Higgins label. This one was made circa 1975 by Bob Allen Fashion. Hi, we're not on the range today. We're at one of our training facilities, so hopefully you won't have to put up with too much gunfire in the background. But what I want to talk about... ...until the handle breaks off and you gotta call a doctor to pull it out again. It is true that I have not competed in any competitions where I could have earned a Pokemon Pogue Dirty Harry Potter Dungeon Master rating. But the idea that I haven't been in any shooting competitions, I've been in a few. I have no shortage of people who have a look of shock and disbelief on their face when they're told that I have a 3.9 collegiate GPA. But I would ask that if you're going to make commentary disparaging my character and telling me how bad or wrong or stupid I am, I do have two requests of you. One, at least watch the video that you're commenting on, and two, put a little bit of effort into being right. So is body armor worth wearing? You be the judge. So two big questions come up about this gun. One, why would I pick this gun? And the answer is because I like the classics. And two, is a 25 ACP really powerful enough to do anything? 
Well, we have a video comparing the 22 long rifle to the 25 ACP in pocket guns with some interesting results. But for right now, let's shoot our favorite target soda jugs. I'll go back seven yards and I'll shoot these with the 25. And what I've got it loaded with is Spear Gold Dot 35 grain jacket at hollow point. Let's see what happens. And there you have it. Hardly devastating, but like they say, the 25 in your pocket beats the 45 you left at home. I also want to make the point that if you're sleeping with a handgun like this, there's a good chance that you are sleeping by yourself. Let me tell you an anecdote. A while ago, a colleague of mine and I went to a big black powder shoot rendezvous. This particular colleague, which was not Joe, he's done quite a bit of shooting, but not so much black powder. Now, the way black powder firearms are traditionally cleaned is with soap and water, then you dry them thoroughly, and then oil them. And that's what we were doing, but he noticed a lot of people at the rendezvous using 409. And he was asking me if he should use it, and I told him, no, don't use it. But all of them are using it. No, don't use 409, just soap and water. But why are all of them using 409? That's what they're doing. Don't use 409, just use soap and water. So does 409 not work? It works, but don't use it. Just use soap and water. And there was a very specific reason I was telling him that. Well, he gets home, goes to the kitchen sink. He's going to clean his black powder firearm. And then he notices sitting there is some porcelain cleaner. Well, he figured that ought to work. And yes, it worked. It cleaned his firearm so well, it cleaned the blue wing right off it. And the reason I'd told him not to use 409 is because I knew him well enough to know that if I told him to use 409, he'd find some 818 and use that, which he did. You have to be very careful about what household cleaners you use on your firearm. And probably the most frequent question I get asked is, who am I to tell you anything about guns? Any one of the many versions of the Weaver stance used to be the way all the cool kids did it. But now it's become fashionable for neophytes to denigrate the Weaver stance and its many versions and say that it's ineffective and always has been. Today we're talking about shooting your concealed carry handgun from inside your pocket. This is 762 by 25 ammo. It's Eastern Bloc military ammunition and the head stamp tells me it was made in 1952, so it's well over 60 years old and it came in these nice little brown paper packages tied up with string, which, yes, are one of my favorite things. I was dealing with a mentally ill woman. And, side note, Wilberforce, I'm not talking about you. Not everything's about you. In fact, virtually nothing is about you. You are not special, and you're not the only mentally ill person who stalks the channel. Situational awareness, belief, and the ability to make good decisions in a bad situation. And there you have it, our field expedient flak vest. This is my 1972 Plymouth Roadrunner. Behind the wheel is Chuck. He's the owner-operator of Chuck's Automotive in Salem, Oregon. And he pretty much built the drivetrain of this car from the ground up. Now he's going to do some of the driving today so I can shoot. And because he's pretty much the only man I trust to drive my car. Now Chuck did not do the exterior work in this car. Chuck did this. So how'd we do? I fired four shots and there's five impacts on the shoot and see and then three other peripheral impacts. So altogether, not bad. Looks like we finally found this gun's forte. While in some places in the world, like let's say Ireland, a gun like this is about the highest tech gun you're allowed to have. But you can have a dog like this. And in case you're curious, it weighs nine stone. So, bottom line to the whole thing is, got to get the gun that fits your needs. And when you have the debate over, is a 22 better than a 25, in a pocket gun, there isn't a nickel's worth of difference when you actually start shooting. I was watching a YouTube video recently, and there was some guy on there going on ad nauseum, which admittedly, to get to ad nauseum didn't take very long. But he was going on about how 1911s suck. 
And he said a bunch of things, and he contradicted himself several times. But at one point he said that to take a 1911 like new out of the box and have it work correctly is as rare as a Glock that doesn't work correctly. Okay. This is a break action shotgun. Push the lever to the side and it breaks open and you put a shell in. Got this from my friend Stan, hence it's called the Stan gun. Now when I do this demonstration, I've done this demonstration many times, there's always somebody that says, well, Paul, that's not fair, because the Judge is a compact, concealed carry gun. It's not a full-size target gun like the Model 15. One of the questions I get asked a lot is people ask me to recommend a handgun for them for personal protection or anti-personnel or concealed carry purposes. And the answer I always give is, there is no one-size-fits-all handgun. There is no off-the-cuff recommendation I can make. You have to figure out what fits your hand, what fits your needs, what fits your budget. You have to get some training, work with a lot of different guns, and answer that question for yourself, preferably with some professional guidance. <coughs> Don't try this at home. And I'm certainly not a professional at this. But the real cool thing about this handgun is how many rounds it holds. Is it the right ammo for you? You be the judge. Okay, this might look funny and some people will call this alternative method the butters technique. But in all seriousness, most people have a pelvis that's bigger than their head. And their pelvis is not quite as mobile as their head. And if you shoot someone in the pelvis, it might not be an instantly fatal wound, but it should knock them right down. And so depending on the situation and your ability and the distance and so forth, the butters method might be what you want to do. A difference of three feet per second well within the variation of one round to the next, not enough difference to make a difference. I'm going to say the difference in velocity was effectively none. To test that, we'll use our meat target. Now, for those who haven't seen it before, the meat target is leather couch skin followed by pork steak, pectorals, pork ribs, a bag of oranges to simulate lung tissue, more pork ribs on the back, four layers of t-shirt on the front, four layers on the back, and the whole thing followed by the new and improved high-tech fleece bullet stop. Now, this ring has elfin writing on it. And if I read this correctly, it reads, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. It's the Lord of the Rings ring. And yes, when I put it on, you can still see me. And of course, if I shoot the last shot, the slide will lock back. So for instructional purposes only. And that makes reloading another magazine that much easier. Now, let me tell you an anecdote. Long time ago, I was dating some girl that lived with her parents, and one day my friend Joe and I went over there, and by the way, for those just tuning in, Joe is a very real person. I just changed his name. Well, Joe had just purchased a Beretta 92 FS, and he had it with him, and we go over there, and my girlfriend's father also has a 92 FS, and he wants to show it off. And he proudly proclaims that, quote, I keep it loaded in the safe for home defense, close quote. Well, he leaves the room to go get this gun out of the safe, and with my short attention span, I quickly went off to something else. But about 10 minutes later, he comes back without the gun, and he says to his wife, Honey, can you open the safe for me? I can never get into that thing. So she goes and opens the safe for him, and a few minutes later, he brings back the pistol, unloaded. And I'm looking at this pistol, and it is immaculate. And I'm thinking, wow, this thing looks like it's never been fired. And right about then, he again proudly proclaims, never been fired. Okay. Now, because I was dating his daughter, I wasn't in a position to tell him the two things I really wanted to tell him. But you've got to have some awareness of the balance between accessibility and security. His pistol was so secure he had it in a safe that he couldn't open himself. Joe mail ordered this particular type of 9mm ammunition. And again, it was outside the parameters of what would be considered typical, and I'm giving him the speech about testing it. He assured me that he didn't need to test it because he knew that it was, quote, good ammo. 
Well, I'm sure it was, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to function reliably or shoot accurately in his individual handgun. But he didn't think he needed to test that. And he carried this stuff for years. And there was a time when we were out in the field and I did some impromptu target shooting. And I was shooting something that was against a dirt bank and I said to him, hey, Joe, see if you can hit that. And he tells me he doesn't want to shoot that. Why not? Because I'm loaded with my Hurtenberger Buscadero Ticondas, and I don't want to shoot my Ticondas. On another occasion, we went jackrabbit hunting. Now, we get in the vehicle, and our rifles are in the back. We have our handguns on us. We drive about 10 miles out of town, park in the sagebrush. As soon as we got out of the car, a jackrabbit comes loping by, as close to a walk as a jackrabbit can manage. And Joe aims his pistol at this rabbit, and he aims, and he aims and he aims and finally the rabbit wanders off into the bushes and Joe what were you waiting for I didn't want to shoot it obviously why not because I'm loaded with my Hurtenberger Buscadero Ticondas and I don't want to shoot my Ticondas now when it comes to rifles I'm not going to make any recommendation of any specific make or model I'm going to say only a few things such as the 22 that you have is a whole lot better than the AR or the AK that you don't have. The 22 that you know how to use is probably a lot better than the AR or the AK that you don't know how to use. Now this is a double-barreled shotgun. Two very important things. One, I'm not recommending double-barreled shotguns. Two, after that nonsense Joe Biden said, it's difficult to talk about double-barreled shotguns and sound intelligent, but I'm going to try. This gun is very simple, almost as simple as the single shot. Some double barrels will only have one trigger, you just pull it twice, a lot of them have two triggers. The most complicated thing about a gun like this is remembering which trigger goes with which barrel. The way I remember it is, you're either right out front or you're left behind. Most of the time, your right barrel is activated by your front trigger, your left barrel by your rear trigger. You're right out front or you're left behind. The Beretta 92FS is the commercially available version of the M9, which has been standard military issue for decades. But it's now being phased out in favor of the M17. With that, it is inexorable that people are going to debate which one of these is better. I'm going to say that neither of them is better, it's just which is better for you. And one of the adults pulls out this brake action pellet gun. Now, some pellet guns have a compensator at the end of the bore. It, it looks like some sort of suppressor, but it isn't. Well, this pellet gun had one, and it had a really simple rudimentary scope on it. One of the adults is holding this pellet gun, and one of these 12-year-old kids looks at him and says, quote, Is that a sniper? Now, he was trying to say, is that a sniper rifle, but he couldn't quite get the whole sentence out. And this adult, with a look that was a combination of shock, horror, disgust, says to the kid, it's a pellet gun. To which the kid replies, but is it a sniper? Let me tell you a couple of Joe stories. And for those just tuning in, yes, Joe is a very real person. Way back when we all had Mini 14s, the one I had was virtually identical to this one. Mine did not have a flash suppressor. Joe bought one, again, just like this one, but he modified it. He put on an aftermarket pistol grip folding stock and a flash suppressor. So even though his rifle and mine were, in terms of their function, identical, his looked more space age. And there were several occasions where we were out doing our thing where we would meet people and they'd look at my rifle and look at his and, what kind of rifle is that? Not understanding that our two rifles are essentially identical just because his looked scary. There was an occasion where Joe and I were traveling in two separate cars. He was following me. I went through a green light. Well, he didn't want to get stuck, so he ran the yellow a little too much and got pulled over by the police. He had his tricked out Mini 14 with him, loaded, which was 100% legal in that jurisdiction at that time. But when the police officer saw that, he, in Joe's words, freaked out. And remember, Joe and I were both in the military at the time. And this police officer started going on about, you can't take your AR off post. And Joe tried in vain several times to explain to him 
It's not an AR, it's a Ruger Mini 14. Look at what's stamped on the rifle itself. It's a Ruger Mini 14 to no avail. This police officer calls back up. The second cop gets there and the first cop shows him the rifle and says, run the serial number on this AR. And I'm sitting here about a block away watching this farce unfold. Well, they ran the serial number and they finally determined that they couldn't show that any law had been broken and they had to let Joe go. Of course, ordering him to unload and disassemble the rifle and put it in the trunk of his car. And that kind of thing is a problem you might run into when you have a scary looking rifle like this. And here's some PMC bronze 44 Magnum 180 grain jacket at hollow point. Nineteen sixty five, nineteen seventy two, nineteen eighty four, nineteen seventy nine, Timber, nineteen seventy nine, Timber. Secondly, everything I'm going to tell you today are just my opinions and my opinions are based on my education and my experience. Different people have different experiences, so they have different opinions. I make no claim that my opinions have their origin in the mind of greatness, and you should be incredulous to those who do. And finally, in saying this, you're going to have to put up with my Shatner-esque pauses and my speech impediment, and I appreciate your indulgence. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not exactly what it looked like. Well, fit through the window, agile enough to get through it, barely on both counts. You also have to remember this isn't baseball. You're not safe just because your foot hit the bag. Once you get through there, you've got to get down and allow this to be cover for I spent 20 years in the military. In my initial enlistment, I was in the active duty Marine Corps for four years. I had an infantry MOS, it was an 0311, but I spent a couple of years as a combat marksmanship instructor at the Marine Corps Security Forces School. So as such, I had to have training and education beyond what normal Marines were getting at that time. So in addition to basic training, infantry training school, and so on, I also went to a couple of, of citizen schools, such as the Ray Chapman Academy of Practical Shooting, and a course at Gunsight. I also went to the Navy's CRF school, that's a SWAT school, and I got sent to a Marine Corps school called the Formal Schools Instructor Course, where you learn to create class outlines and select tasks for training and create a curriculum and teach classes. And you know, that's actually been very useful. Anyway, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went into the reserve component of the military, specifically the Oregon Army National Guard. Again, I had an infantry MOS, I was in a light infantry company, and I went to some additional training such as Air Assault School, Master Fitness Trainer School, Advanced NCO School, and another course at Gunsight. I also had the opportunity to participate in military shooting competitions. I won six state championships for shooting, also a Western Regional Championship, a National Championship, and an International Pistol Shooting Championship. Not only that, I've competed in a lot of, of competitions at just gun clubs and things like that. I've done a lot of rimfire stuff, a lot of black powder stuff. The question comes up, what if you have to fire from inside your purse? You reach in and you have to fire before you can get the gun out. Well, I'm going to use this bag to demonstrate that because I think if we destroy it, no one will miss it. Now this purse does have a really nice, I guess that's a coiled snake medallion, and it's got this cool design on it here that it's supposed to be a flower, and inside it I've got my Ruger LC9. So I'll shoot at this target that's about three yards away, and we'll try to determine two things. First, can I hit it, and secondly, can I do this without creating a malfunction? And it would appear the answer to both of those questions is yes. Hey, Paul, what would happen if you loaded, let's say, a 270 cartridge with black powder? Now, that's an interesting question. But before I could even answer him, somebody pops off and says, Well, the bullet wouldn't even get out the end of the barrel! <laughs> but there's two things I've heard people say that I really want to address. 
One is the saying that a 22 isn't much, but it sure beats nothing. That might seem axiomatic, but I'm going to put it to the test. So what I've got is the two soda jugs on your right, I'm going to engage those with nothing. And then I'll engage the two soda jugs on your left with a 22 rifle, and we'll see which is more effective. So first, the jugs on the right with nothing. Okay, marginally effective. Now let's engage the jugs on the left with a 22. You be the judge, but I'm going to say the 22 is more effective. And I'll engage the two soda jugs on the right with the 44 Magnum, but I'll miss. And then I'll engage the two soda jugs on the left with the 22 rifle, but I'll hit them. And let's see which one is more effective. Okay. Again, I'm gonna to have to go with the 22 wins. and I'm going to shoot it with my Colt government model, caliber 38 Super, which I have loaded with Remington Green and White Box 38 Super Automatic Plus P 130 grain full metal jacket round nose. I'm in the field. I'm not in my yard or anything. I'm in Vindrin Dow, or Lop. And when I'm in the field, I don't trust my life to a 1911. Lock, baby. And the thing that I mashed on it and took a big wind up, I didn't take a Pete Townsend wind up, I just hit the thing. There have been some occasions where I have been called upon to show people how to reload revolvers. And when I have said things very similar to what Masad Ayub said, like give it a good tap, and one sharp slap, I find that I say that and then someone will gently push on the ejector rod and I tell them, no, give it a good tap. And they'll gently push on the ejector rod and I say, no, give it a sharp slap. And they'll gently push on the ejector rod until finally I say, hey, hey, hit it. And that gets through. And that's why I tend to overemphasize that point. Now everybody, I'm almost done. You won't have to bear with me that much longer. In the past, Gun Nuts has proclaimed that I have never been in any shooting competitions. Okay, if the goal was to tell a bald-faced lie, if the goal was to generate my disgust and generate my contempt, mission accomplished. I have a lot of contempt for people who make me drag this crap out of the basement, and this isn't all of it. In fact, the tote box still has a few things left in it I didn't even put on the table. But I have done a little bit of competition shooting. Now, in his recent whiskey fuel rant, he's going on about titles he holds and ratings he has, and he's a seventh level of Dante's towering Inferno McQueen Newman Redford Butch and Sundance shooter. And that is very, well, I, I guess it's impressive. And he was also saying something to the effect of, I don't have an SPAZ rating. Well, I'm pretty sure I don't, but I'm very confident that he does. But while talking about what shooting competitions I may or may not have done, somebody commented on his whiskey-fueled rant, and I wrote some of this stuff down because I want to make sure I get it right, and asked if he was aware that I have won state, regional, national, and international shooting championships. And his reply to that person was, Yeah, I'm aware. I'm very aware that he doesn't cite who the sanctioning body for any of those championships was, which makes them meaningless. <sighs> okay. Let me show you something that you may have seen before.
Now that display for quite a while appeared at the beginning of a lot of the presentations we did. It was created by Stan, our late post-production guy, and so now we don't use it anymore. And to be blunt, I really didn't want to use it in the first place, and I don't really think it's necessary, and that's part of the reason we don't use it anymore. However, I see now that was a mistake on my part, and we're going to have to redo something like that. But as far as citing a sanctioning body, you can clearly see these plaques. I've got six of them. And presuming that you completed fifth grade geography, you can easily see that that's an outline of the state of Oregon. And it's very clearly printed on this plaque Oregon National Guard. Okay, everyone, my apologies for sitting here like this for the conclusion portion of today's presentation. I know this looks lame, but the reality is I am lame, and this might be the last time you ever see me on camera.